the greatest conflict of all times. I think it was Barnhouse, uh, Donald Gray Barnhouse, who called it the Invisible War. Uh, I got saved through reading a book. I thought I was buying a book on Satan worship. I bought it in the occult section in the a bookstore in Central Station in Montreal, uh, Satan is Alive and Well on Planet Earth, uh, written by Hal Lindsey, regardless of what you think of his eschatological views or uh, even his moral life. I think he was married about three or four times. Uh, God used uh, his word, which was uh, within that book, as he outlined human history and, and where we are as a human race and different th things and how, uh, and how we got there. It was interesting that at uh, Prairie, the Bible school that Lynn and I and the kids had the privilege of going to, that in the married student quarters, which was 20 families, seven of us were saved through reading one of Hal Lindsey's books. Very interesting, I found. Uh, and again, regardless of a person's eschatological view, uh, he always seemed to know how to present the gospel where the rubber meets the road, right where you're at. He spoke in layman's terms, and uh, it reached me where I was at. The Spirit of God reached me, obviously, but God using uh, him. Ted Rendell, the uh, principal of the school at the time, he stated that when a Christian or when a person is born again, we're born for battle. I love that. We're born for battle. In other words, the Christian life is a, is a battle. It's a fight. And you see that imagery throughout the scriptures. And others have identified this raging battle as the conflict of the ages. And guys, we're in the midst of it. And what we see going on in the States, what we see going on all over, all over the world, it's all part of this conflict, this battle that we have been uh, born into, uh, so to speak. But we are to be salt and light in the midst of that battle. Uh, we'll get into all of that a little bit later. Regardless of what we call it, it's obvious that there's an unseen enemy at work behind the scenes. An, en an enemy who plays for keeps. As a matter of fact, I just got an email from uh, a couple. Actually, it wasn't written to me. It was written to a friend of mine, Gary Weeks, lives in Toronto now. We spent many years together together in Ireland, and uh, uh, this individual, Nigel uh, Philipson, as he was writing to Gary, he says, I always remember something that Russ said about 20 years ago. It was a very simple statement, Satan plays for keeps. Never forget that. He, he knows it's not a, a playground that we're on, but it's a battleground, and he, he plays for keeps. He's knocked a lot of uh, people out of the game. And one tactic he uses against the Lord's people is that of temptation. I wonder if anyone who's listening tonight have ever, has ever been tempted. And you didn't know where, they, didn't know where the temptation came from. All of a sudden, there's this thought in your mind or this thing or this pull or draw. Just like Eve, as she's minding her own business and enjoying everything that God had given to her. And all of a sudden now her focus is on the one thing that God has forbidden. And we know that behind the scenes, the evil one was drawing her attention to that. He still works in very similar ways today. As long as we live in this fallen world, there will be temptation. And only on the other side of the grave will we experience 100% freedom from temptation. I would almost assure you that everyone hearing me, myself included, uh, that you've been tempted today in some way, shape, or form. Temptation has come to you. Satan is desperate in doing and going out of, out of his way to destroy the witness of God's people in his church. All that being said, as I read my Bible, I must conclude that Christians can and do overcome temptation. And I'm going to quote, and I have no idea where the quote comes from. I have a little note here, unknown. But God does not make it impossible for his children to sin. But he does make it possible for his children not to sin. I mean, God could just 
flip a switch and say it will now be impossible for God's children to sin. But, but he doesn't do that. But he has made it possible for his children not to sin when temptation comes. And so I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 4. A very familiar passage. We could have looked at Matthew chapter, or sorry, Luke chapter 4. We may flip back there uh, possibly next week. And again, tonight is just basically introductory. There's going to be all kinds of different statements uh, that we will be making. And I'm going to actually start in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 13 at the baptism of Jesus as he's entering into his public ministry. So Matthew chapter 3, starting at verse 13. Then Jesus came to Galilee, or sorry, came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And, and John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you're coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And we're going to be focusing on that, if not tonight, next week. But notice specifically it says that Jesus was led by the Spirit. And I believe over in Luke's Gospel it says Jesus being full or being filled with the Holy Spirit was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And then there is a purpose clause. Why did the Spirit of God lead Jesus into the wilderness? To be tempted by the devil. Oh, that's a tough one. Filled with the Spirit, led by the Spirit, for the specific purpose of being tempted by the devil in the wilderness. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If, I'll just make the comment here, that's not an if of doubt. There's four different classes of if, uh, conditional clauses, whatever you, you want to call them. Uh, the first is the first class condition is if and it's true. The word you could have here is since. He's not casting doubt on the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. Satan knows he's the Son of God. Jesus knows he's the Son of God. And Satan is saying to Jesus, because you are the Son of God, how come you find yourself in this kind of a condition? Maybe you've asked yourself that question. I'm, I'm a child of God. I'm a Christian. How come I am in this situation? I know I'm a child of God. I know I'm a saved man. I know I have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling within me. I know I'm here because God has led me here. Then why am I going through what I'm going through? Maybe you've been tempted that way. I know I have many times in my life. And so again, back to verse 1. Then Jesus was led. Uh, up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the Spirit. Uh, sorry, by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterward, he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If, or since, you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, one of my favorite words in the Bible, and it is one word. The word is gegraptai. You'll see it at the bottom of the bulletin, the front page, every week. It is one of my favorite verbs, uh, it is a verb, but words in the Bible, gegraptai. It simply means, it is finished. It was written in the past, or it is written, it was written in the past with the results that it stands written today. And will remain written throughout the endless ages of eternity. Gegraptai, one word, in the perfect tense. Written in the past with the result that it stands written today with the exact same authority and power that it was written by the original authors. And so Jesus says, Gibraltar is it, it is written. And he's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word 
that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the, whole, into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If, again, since, or because you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written. Ah, Satan knows how to quote scripture. As a matter of fact, he's basically saying to, to Jesus, oh, you want to quote scripture, do you? Well, I've got a couple for you. And he quotes scripture. And this is what he says. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you. He's quoting Psalm 91, verse 11. And in their hands, they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Verse 12 of Psalm 91. Jesus said to him, the graptai, it is written, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And he's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 16. Again, the, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if Maybe you will, maybe you won't. Now, this is a third-class condition. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. And I will give you all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and 13. Then it says in verse 11, Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. A few, again, introductory, and I am keeping my eye on the time, so I don't take us past, uh, to, uh, past 8 o'clock or a little bit past, maybe. But a few introductory passages. I think you would probably all be familiar with 1 John 1 9. If we confess, the word confess simply means to say the same thing as, or if we agree with, if we confess our sins, He, the Lord God, is faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then over in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, John writes, My little children, these things are right to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. But you see, any time we have to use 1 John 1, 9, it's already too late. I mean, I thank God for 1 John 1, 9. I thank God for 1 John 2, 1 and 2. But it's already too late. That means I have already sinned. I have already, in a sense, defiled my wedding garments. I've soiled uh, the wedding garment. And I thank God that there is a means of cleansing. And that means is through the blood of Jesus Christ, which has already been shed. That sin has already been atoned for. And now I can enter back into fellowship with the Lord by coming and having that foot washing, so to speak, uh, that Jesus uh, talked about uh, in the upper room, uh, the night in which he was betrayed and the night before he died on the cross. And so there is a better verse. If there is such a thing as a better verse in the Bible, one over another. Uh, but in this situation, uh, 1 Corinthians 10.13 I hope you know this one. It was one of the first ones that Marty Wolf taught me after we were, I was saved. He, he, he said, Rush, you got to know 1 John 1, 9, but you also have to know 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And it says this. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will also make the way of escape 
that you may be able to bear it. God is telling us that there is no temptation that is, if I can use the word, unique or peculiar just to us, that we are the only ones going through this. No, there's no temptation that has taken us, but such as is common to men. And God, he promises, will not allow us to be tempted beyond that which we're able to endure. But along with the temptation, he will provide the way of escape. What is the way of escape? I could say I don't know, but I believe uh, to a degree. Uh, it's in the same place that the temptation was introduced. In your mind. I don't know if any have read John Bunyan's. I know most have probably read Pilgrim's Progress, but I wonder if you've read uh, his other uh, great uh, analogy uh, uh, called the Holy War. And the Holy War is about man's soul and, and, and how the evil one is seeking to penetrate into the city of man's soul. And there's five gates. gates. There's the eye gate, there's the ear gate, there's the nose gate, there's the mouth gate, and then there's the feel gate. And these are the gates or the entry points in which the evil one comes and seeks to penetrate into man's soul, into the mind. And this is how the evil one comes today. He seeks to enter into our mind through some thought, through a look, through something we hear. Could be a smell. You say, how can smell do that? Well, you talk to the guys that I talked to at the creek, and all they have to do is get one whiff of grass, one whiff of alcohol, one sight of that drink that has held them in slavery, or just hearing about it, enticing them. And it's in the thought, in the mind. And if the person now starts to dwell upon that thought, they start to consider that an option. That's exactly what happened in the Garden of Eden with the woman. He got her to dwell and to think upon the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that which God forbid her to eat from. Now she's thinking about it. She starts to think that it's an option, that she can actually sin and get away with it, God didn't really mean what he said this time, or at least not in my case, he didn't. And so that thought comes into the mind and we now start thinking of this, whatever the thought is, whatever the temptation is, we start seeing that as a viable option. And we start to dwell upon it. And I think you've heard me say different times when I hear of someone obsessed with something, whether it's pornography or whether it's this or whether it's that, and they say, well, I spend the whole day praying about it. And I tell them, that's your problem. You're praying too much. Because while you're praying, all you're doing is thinking about it. God has already delivered you from that. He's already delivered you. You have the fullness of God, the Holy Spirit, and you need to walk in the power that which, of which God has given to you. And we'll get and we'll see the different weaponry that God has uh, laid in our arsenal. And once a person or once I act upon that, I've sinned. I have transgressed the law of God. Whether it's in my thought, whether it's in my words, whether it's in my overt actions. But there's a better verse. Again, if there's such a thing as better verses in the Bible, a better verse than 1 John 1, 9. And I believe a better verse than 1 Corinthians 10, 13, because if we're always in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, we're always struggling back and forth, back and forth. Galatians 5, 16 says this. I say then, walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to the other, so that you, then it says, you do not do the things that you want. But if you are led by the spirit, or if you are walking by the spirit, 
who are not under law. And walking in the spirit is to walk in the way, to walk in the truth, to walk in the power that God has given to us. Galatians 6, 8 says this, For he who sows to his flesh shall with the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. So are we going to sow to the flesh, or are we going to sow to the Spirit? We have the Spirit of God within. We have the Word of God. We have all the means available to us. And so when that first thought comes to the mind, and it will come, there comes that time when we must turn our thoughts, maybe to, uh, I should read it, uh, Philippians chapter 4. And verse 8, we need to evaluate the thoughts that come to our mind. Over there in Corinthians, it talks about, and I think it's in 2 Corinthians, about bringing every thought to the captivity to the obedience of Jesus Christ. So every thought that comes into our mind, if it's a, th a thought that is seeking to lead us contrary and away from the will and the word of God, we need to immediately take that thought and bring it into obedience to the mind and to the will of God through Christ. Finally, brethren, this is over in Philippians uh, 4 verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, worthy, meditate on these things. And even as I read that verse, that is a rebuke to me right now, as we were talking earlier before the prayer meeting started, the absolute garbage that is coming across our televisions. These aren't thoughts that enter, that come to my mind that produce praiseworthy, noble, truthful, trustworthy thoughts. As a matter of fact, it creates within me an anxiety. And I just reading this, I realize I'm not bringing those thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. I'm listening to lies, maybe half truths. I, I don't know. And it's upsetting. But the only reason I would allow it to upset me is because I'm not simply following the pattern and the blueprint that God has given me to exercise my mind and to train my mind to think on these things. If there's, how does it say there? If there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, med meditate on these things. I don't find anything praiseworthy thinking and meditating upon the things that I see coming across the uh, newsreels uh, in this day and age. Simply make no provision for the flesh. Almost feel I need to turn around, take that TV off the wall and throw it out onto the, uh, onto the uh, driveway. There might be a few people down there who'll catch and set it up in their house. So, but. I don't think that that's almost like cutting off the hand, plucking out the eye, cutting off the foot. Uh, I just need to discipline myself to avoid that which would cause me the inner turmoil. Anyway, that's my own personal thing going on right now. Probably shouldn't bring it out in a message, but uh, I think I'm amongst friends. And uh, I think we all go through, if not that, other things that, that get us. And we realize that the, these aren't things that are praiseworthy. These aren't, aren't things that bring glory to God as I filter and meditate upon them. I want to now just bring out some thoughts because we're going to be dealing with the Holy Spirit as we look at the temptation. We've just touched on it when we read the passage that Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for the purpose of being tempted by the devil. And so I want to just look at, excuse me, Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Satan is going to, he is seeking to get Jesus to act apart from the Holy Spirit, apart from the promptings, the indwelling presence, apart, apart from what Jesus would know the Spirit of God is saying to him. Satan is trying to get him to act independently of the Holy Spirit who has been provided to him.
First of all, Jesus voluntarily set apart or set aside his glory. We see that in, in, in Philippians chapter 1 from around verses 5 through 8. Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, he humbled himself and he became a man. He took upon himself the likeness of a man, and not just a man, but a, a servant or a slave, and he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus voluntarily laid aside his glory. He humbled himself, and he comes into this world as a man, 100% human, 100% humanity. He was one of us, and yet he was undiminished deity. 100% humanity, 100% man, 100% God. We understand that. It was the Holy Spirit that sustained the humanity of Jesus Christ during his earthly ministry. We'll see some verses in just a moment. But it was the Holy Spirit of God that will sustain the Lord Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry. It was a man, Adam, that sinned in the garden. Therefore, it must be a man that pays the penalty for sin. It must be someone of Adam's equal. But it was the holiness of God that was defiled, that was offended. Therefore, it must be one of God's equal to pay the penalty. Therefore, the incarnation. 1 Timothy 3.16. I love the 3.16 passages in the Bible. You just go through the Bible sometime especially in the New Testament, read all the 316 passages. It's incredible. I don't think it's inspired, but it's still incredible. Um, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. And Paul's saying there's no controversy about this. This is something that's great. God was manifested in the flesh. God became a man. God didn't stop being God, the second person of the Trinity. God became a man. He put on a face. He put on hands. He put on feet. He spent nine months in the womb of, of the virgin womb of his mother, Mary. He was born the way you and I were born. He, he grew and, and he, he went through his, his, his childhood, his, his teen years, his young adult. He, and approximately at the age of 30, he launches into his public ministry. So God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. And I always love telling people that there is a man. There is a human being in glory today, seated at the right hand of God the Father. His name is Jesus Christ. And the one who is seated at the right hand of God the Father whose name is Jesus Christ. He's a Jew. There is a Jew in heaven, glorified. His name is Jesus. Yahweh, or Jehovah, saves, is seated at the right hand of God the Father. That's an incredible thought. And Jesus' incarnation will remain throughout the endless ages of eternity. My mind can't grapple with that. The incarnation took place 2,000 years ago. So up until 2,000 years ago, the man, Christ Jesus, was not seated at the right hand of God the Father. Oh, the second person of the Trinity was. But he had not yet been incarnate and come into human flesh. But today, there is a man glorified seated at the right hand of God the Father, one who is God's equal, one who is man's equal, one who is my representative, one who is all-powerful, who is omniscient, omnipresent, 
who, who, who knows all things, all powerful, and all of the attributes of God, incarnate in human flesh, glorified today. The Holy Spirit's involvement in sustaining Christ during his earthly ministry was prophesied in the Old Testament. At least 700 years before this one came, before the second person of the triunity took on human flesh and was born and brought into the world in fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophets from the time of, uh, of, of, of uh, Adam, all the way right through, and, and then Jesus is born. But the fact that he would be sustained by the Holy Spirit during his earthly ministry was prophesied. Listen to Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. This is messianic. This was foretelling that when this one would be born, who would fulfill all of the Old Testament prophets, when the Messiah would come, he would be sustained by the power, energy, the indwelling presence of God, the Holy Spirit. Again, over in Isaiah 42, 1, another messianic, a prophecy, behold, my, my servant, whom I behold, sorry, whom I uphold, my elect one, in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. God the Father put the Holy Spirit, the first person of the Trinity, put the third person of the, whole, of, 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 of the, of the blessed Trinity upon the second person of the Trinity when he was walking the face of the earth. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. Well, not just to the Jews. He's not just the Jewish Messiah. He has come to take away the sin of the world, as John the Baptist uh, would say. Then in Isaiah 61, 1, and we recognize that this is what Jesus quoted when he went back to Nazareth after his baptism. And he was given the scroll. He takes Isaiah. And this was the place of the reading, and this is what he reads, but he's reading from Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is messianic. Jesus will read this prophecy in the synagogue in Nazareth, and he will say, this day, this prophecy has been fulfilled. Oh. He was claiming this prophecy was written about himself, and he's doing that in his not really his hometown, but the place where he grew up. So it says, the Spirit of the Lord has come upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. And it would go on. And so the Holy Spirit's involvement in sustaining Jesus Christ, during his earthly ministry, was prophesied in the Old Testament, fulfilled in the New Testament, in the Gospels. And then Jesus had an unlimited supply. I almost have a hard time using that word, an unlimited supply, as if it was some kind of liquid or, or something. Uh, but he had an unlimited supply or unlimited resource of the Holy Spirit's indwelling power. There was no limit to the Spirit's power operational into the, in the life of Jesus Christ as a man. You see, Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, who existed in eternity past, he had fellowship with the Holy Spirit. He had fellowship with the Father. But now the man, Christ Jesus, as he walks the face of this earth, as he is here to fulfill the will of his Father in heaven, he is filled with the Holy Spirit of God. The man Christ Jesus is filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And he has unlimited access to the 
divine power that the Spirit of God provides in the filling of a human being. Matthew 3.16 When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw, in other words, uh, he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. Matthew 12.28 But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Jesus was claiming, was simply saying, that everything he was doing, he was doing in accordance with the power of the Spirit of God. It was the Holy Spirit of God that was giving him the power, that was guiding and directing him as he walked and ministered there in Galilee and Judea, up in uh, Tyre and Sidon. Wherever Jesus Christ moved, he was moving in the power and energy of God the Holy Spirit. He was being led by the Spirit of God. And so sensitive to that leading, he would even allow himself to be led by the Spirit of God into the wilderness where this express purpose of being tempted by the evil one. He would be led by this very same Spirit three years later to be led to a place called Calvary. It was the Spirit of God that was sustaining Jesus Christ through it all. He was obedient to the promptings of God the Holy Spirit and what he did he did in the energy and power of God the Holy Spirit. And as I just finished saying that Jesus was controlled and led by the Spirit while on earth. No need to quote uh, Luke chapter 4 again. But we saw that he was filled with the Spirit and being filled with the Spirit he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of Satan. And then the Holy Spirit, this is one I have a hard time getting my head around, but I believe it to be true. The Holy Spirit discontinued sustaining Jesus while he bore our sins at Calvary. Psalm 21, sorry, 22.1, a messianic psalm. My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? And then the fulfillment of that prophecy in Matthew 27, verse 45 and 46, as he hangs upon the cross at the point where the sky becomes dark, God has pulled the curtain down. No human being is going to see the sufferings of Calvary in their spiritual dimension. And for the first time in all of eternity, I believe that God the Father and God the Holy Spirit turned their back on the second person of the Trinity as he became sin on that cross. He became sin. He who knew no sin became sin. That he might make you and I the righteousness of God in him. And for the first time of all in all of eternity, he is cut off. From the fellowship that he has enjoyed through the endless ages of eternity. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken Many believe that the first, my God, it was addressed to God the Father. The second, my God, was addressed to God the Holy Spirit. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Just a couple more passages, and I'll end this, all of this focus on, on the Holy Spirit, because I believe that it's so vitally important that we recognize that when you and I go through temptation, we have the same Holy Spirit of God dwelling within. The Holy Spirit participated in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 11. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. And then in 1 Peter 3, 18. 
For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh and made alive by the Spirit. And so it was the Spirit of Christ, the, sorry, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, who participated in other passages where Jesus said, destroy this temple. He said, and I will raise it up in three days. Other passages speak of the Father raising up the Son. And so all three members of the triunity of the Trinity were active in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, because I believe all three uh, were active throughout the earthly ministry of Jesus on earth. And so just in closing this group of thoughts, Jesus entered into the temptation by Satan as a man. It is the humanity of Jesus Christ that is being tempted here. You say, well, you can't dissect the humanity. I understand that. Deity cannot be tempted. James tells us that. James 1, 13, 14 and 15. But let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. Why? For God cannot be tempted with evil. And so if Jesus Christ is being tempted in the wilderness by the evil one, it is hu his humanity that is being tempted because deity cannot be tempted. It's impossible. You cannot tempt deity to do evil. Only humanity can be tempted. Now the whole question, could Jesus have sinned? I do not believe Jesus could have sinned. But it was his humanity because it was a man who was tempted in the garden. It must be a man who is now being tempted again, no longer in a garden, but in a wilderness. The deck was stacked in Adam's favor in the garden. Every tree he could eat except for one. In the wilderness, there was nothing to eat for 40 days. In the wilderness or in the garden, Adam had everything. In the wilderness, Jesus had nothing. And Jesus is the last Adam. There will be no other Adam. Jesus is the last Adam. And if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old man is in Adam, lost, dying, helpless, hopeless, cursed. As a new creature, I am in Christ. Old things, all that I was in Adam has passed away. All things have become new. In Christ. A wonderful truth. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full blown, grown, blown uh, grown, sorry, that it brings forth death. And one last verse, and with it I'll ask a question. It's Hebrews 2.18, as we think of next week. Uh, for in that he himself, referring to Jesus, has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Isn't that good to know? Jesus Christ is able to aid each one of us who are tempted. And we're going to see that the very same weaponry, because it is a battle that we're in, the very same weaponry that Jesus utilized when he was being tempted has been given to us by God. We have everything we need to live the life that Jesus Christ has laid before us because we will discover that it is his life in us and only his life in us that can live the life that pleases the Father. So when we do come into temptation, and we will, we can rely on the fact that we are sons of God. We can utilize the power of God, the Holy Spirit. We can utilize the power of the Word of God. The Word of God is alive and powerful. That's why Jesus used it. Anyway, we'll stop there uh, for now. You may have questions or thoughts or uh, different things. Some things you might have heard that may sound strange. I, I don't know.